What do you do on Sundays? We talk about Kate Blanchett, the acting, the costumes, the awards, but mostly the Blanchett of it all. Oh, oh. I'm not acting. <laughs> you think this is a love affair? I saw you, Erica, meeting in the middle. This is Sundays with Kate, and I'm your host, Mortada El Fadi. Welcome to Sundays with Kate, the podcast series about the films of Kate Blanchett. Every week we choose a Kate Blanchett film and discuss it with a guest. This week, we are going back to our mini series on Carol, the movie that is most beloved by Blanchett acolytes. It's that perfect storm of a great film, a great performance, and real life cultural capital that still brings up passion and conversation six years after its release. So in this episode, we will try to answer the question of why Carol and why is Kate Blanchett so perfect as Carol? Um, and for this conversation, I've always think of Carol as a community and I have been watching Carol and going to Carol screenings in New York since it opened. And through those screenings, I have met people who are just as passionate about this film. And I think of them as my Carol friends. And so I'm very happy to welcome to the podcast one of my Carol friends, Maggie Larkin. Maggie, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast to talk about Carol. Something I can talk about at length. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you are probably the only person I know who has watched Carol more than I have. Yeah, probably. <laughs> There was a solid year where I did fall asleep to it every night. That's when it was on Netflix, right? And that was like the, the time between it leaving the theater and its release on streaming and DVD. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is... <laughs> the, the dark ages, as we call it, when we had no Carol in our lives. <laughs> uh, I have seen Carol a lot. I've seen it eight times when it opened. And then there was the Christmas screenings at the Metrograph, which we right. have, we have we... went together once. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and I'm so happy that Metrograph does that and has decided to take it on as an annual Christmas thing um, because it is a Christmas and New Year's movie. Yes, absolutely. So Maggie, we've talked about you've seen Carol a lot. Why do you see why do you think it resonates? Why do you go back to it? I think it's the fact that it ends happily or we think it ends happily um, is a way to kind of give us hope. When uh, when may, we may not feel hope in our own lives, maybe romantically. Um, not that I'm speaking from experience or anything, but um, just like seeing someone as beautiful as Kate Blanchett, as Carol, and being like, oh, she, and also she's a lesbian, and maybe that could happen to me. I don't know. Wishful thinking, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the hopeful note is is something beautiful, and I think... that was sort of like the driving force behind the movie and why the filmmakers wanted to make it and why, why the book is something that people love and go back to and have loved for decades, right? Right. Like, in terms of the book especially, the, the pulp novels that had bad endings haven't really survived with the same legacy that a book like Carol has. And I think that is part of the reason why the story is so special to us. because it is such a departure from the, uh, the format. Yeah. Um, so for this episode of Sundays with Kate, I wanted to talk about, I've always thought that Kate Blanchett was so perfectly cast as Carol. Um, when I read The Price of Salt, I read it before the movie. Oh. Okay. So before the movie was announced. So I didn't know... who was like who to cast. But when I was reading it, I, because the movie said in, in the 40s, early 50s, I, I was thinking of Marlena Dietrich. Oh, yeah. But Marlena is no longer with us. She's forever in our hearts. Yeah. But uh, she's left this corporeal form, <laughs> left this plane of existence. Um, yeah, it's, I found it's always helpful when reading something to cast it in my brain. That's how I kind of keep up with the story and, and feel it more deeply. So okay. I can see... I can definitely see more Lena. Yeah, and so when, when the movie was announced, obviously it was announced with Kate, and this is, you know, as listeners of this podcast know, I've admitted that I have followed the casting and the whole production of Carol 
you know, the real ones know there was the the blog that, yes. <laughs> that talked. So through all that time, I read the book again, and then somebody slipped me the screenplay, oh. <laughs> which was fun, and I read the screenplay. That was all before the movie came out. And so when the movie came out, I was kind of ready. Right. Ready for Carol. I have already imagined it as Kate. I knew she was going to do a good job. And sort of when I was thinking, why do I think she was so perfect for for this portrayal? I think there's a couple of things that I thought of. Um, So what makes Kate Bunch such a compelling screen presence also makes her perfect for Carol. So I think there is, she brings to her performances a confidence. Yes. Mixed with this sort of otherworldly glamour. Like, mm-hmm. there has never been a more glamorous right. actress. And, and, like, effortlessly glamorous. Yes. Yes. Um, maybe only Marlena Dietrich. So. Yes. Yeah. Like, Greta Garbo. Like, there are a handful of them who are true glamour queens. Yeah. yeah. And I think from, you know, people who could, could nominate other people from her age group, but I think there is nobody like her. Um, and then I think the other thing that really struck me about this performance and why I think makes her so perfect is that what Kate is doing in this movie is she's playing Carol as a character who is, you know, going through this uh, love story with Therese, dealing with her husband, with her daughter, with her friend, all of these things. But in all the scenes that she is with Therese, she is playing Therese's idea of Carol. Yes. As the perfect embodiment of femininity. Right. And... Um, and Kate is somebody who's not afraid of acting. So to f- and she's always, you know, acts. Uh, she's not a subtle actor. No, and that comes from her theater background. I think you can. I can tell as someone who has a theater background as well when an actor is performed extensively on stage because she really does embody it in her whole body. Yeah, and so she's not a subtle actor, and so to play the character and play someone's idea of that character that's acting upon acting, which, yes. which just makes her so perfect as Carol Eric. It definitely takes a, an amount of depth, and she has it. Um, and I was thinking that, you know, she plays the text and the subtext, but also at the same time, she doesn't show us all of her cards. Like, there's always a mystery. And the mystery is because Therese doesn't really know Carol she gets to know her right and um i was actually thinking about when i watched it last night um i kind of had a big consciousness shift about her character because i used to think the facade that she was putting on of cool elegance was hiding her anxiety about everything happening in her life but last night i kind of um realized that there was an element of euphoria too to it um that underneath that surface it's boiling with anxiety but boiling with oh my god this is happening like i'm i'm here and i'm i'm a gay woman in the 50s and this isn't allowed but i'm actually meeting someone and falling in love with him and kind of the feeling of maybe her never thinking that would happen to her yeah. um because it was so difficult i mean it's hard for me to find somebody now <laughs> and that we have a dating apps <laughs> i can't imagine how hard it was for was for her to find even another queer woman safely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, she has um, Abby. Right. There's always Abby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. Yes, there's always Abby. But I think, I think Abby is kind of a si- similar situation and maybe could turn into, Therese could turn into another Abby of they meet and they fall in love instantly because... That's all they could do. They couldn't casually date. And then later, as they get to know each other, maybe it doesn't work out. Um, as much as I want to be optimistic about Carol and Therese <laughs> living, lasting forever, um, that could also be it. Yeah. Um, in the way that lesbians love to U-Haul and uh, move in together on the third date. <laughs> like the, at the end of the first date, should we get a cat together? Let's do it. Well... <laughs> I mean, Carol and Therese didn't exactly get a U-Haul, but they did go on this big trip right, together. Right, they basically U-Hauled in a Packard. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to talk to you about, Maggie, about Kate and Carol, is that what I wanted to talk about is sort of like the confidence that mm-hmm. Kate Blanchett brings to her portrayal of Carol. Carol is a very confident woman. You know, she might not 
have everything figured out. She's going through this divorce. She's um, maybe um, not really out, although she's very bold in inviting Therese over and all those things. So I think one of Kate's sort of signature um, in her screen persona is this confidence she brings to all her roles. Like one of the things during this podcast and watching all her movies again, sort of trying to think of a through line between them, there is two things that I found. One is that she always plays these sort of very accomplished, very smart women who have the utmost confidence. Mm -hmm. um, I think she only played one dumb person, which was her um, her character. Oh. <laughs> no, no, yes, right. <laughs> it's like, oh, God, you're really doing that? Okay. Uh, Shiva Hart. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, so... Shiva Hart is completely not smart or confident, but right. everybody... I mean, we love her, but, like, yeah. <laughs> she's our dumb friend. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But everybody else that she's played, and you think of, you know, like, from the movies that worked, like Carol, to the movies that didn't work, like something like Bernadette. Right. Uh, also, she's there, like, she is the most successful architect in all of history. Yes. <laughs> so like, sure. <laughs> and Carol Erd, I think, is the epitome of that. Like she is so confident, she is so put together. Um yes. and you add to that layer of how perfect Therese sees her. And so this kind of this confidence is kind of what makes her such a perfect Kate Blanchett character. Absolutely. And again watching it last night I kind of made a connection that I'd never made before between Carol and Tracy Lord in the Philadelphia story of they both come off as supremely confident, but really underneath they are so terrified and, um, and so not confident, but they have no choice but to act that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of feel that as well. Um, like if someone says I'm brave for doing something, um, I feel like there's no choice. I had to do it. I'm so scared of everything, of everything equally, mm -hmm. that I just do everything because I have to. Yeah. Um, and I feel that with Carol and with Tracy Lord. Um, yeah. Of, um, and like when Tracy meets Jimmy Stewart's character and he sees through her, I, I see that as Therese as well, of um, seeing her vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of comes out at the end when they're having tea. Um, when Carol's saying, I got a new job, I'm a buyer, you know, and she's <laughs> being, she's covering that anxiety that she's about to bear her soul yeah. to Therese with, oh, I have a job and stuff. And, um, and Therese immediately says, have you seen Rindy? Like she, she cuts through that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, they met their, they met each other's matches. Yeah. Really. I love that you brought Catherine Hepburn and Tracy Lords because, you know, Kate famously played Catherine, but I think she is, um, of our current star, she is maybe the one who's closest to Catherine Hepburn's screen persona. I agree. She's more glamorous than Catherine Hepburn, but, but yeah. Yes, she's, she's more willing to uh, the, definitely play the Hollywood game yeah. um, and, and be involved in that way and takes glamour very seriously, I think, fashion very seriously. Um, you know, Kate was always in her dungarees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. no dungarees for our no. for our Kate. <laughs> Not at all. Um, and then you brought up that scene. So I was thinking, you know, when thinking of these things on, on Kate's persona and the character of Carol, and I thought, like, what sort of scenes in Carol sort of bring out the best of Kate? Um, yes. And, you know, everything she does in this movie is perfect. Of um, course. But I thought of a few scenes, so I wanted to bring I up... I did, too. I wanted to talk to you about five scenes um, mm -hmm. where Kate, I think, just from these, from this last watch, I'm sure if I watch this movie again in a month, I will think of five other scenes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but for this... <laughs> That's the beauty of this movie. <laughs> yes. But for this time and this conversation, I want to talk to you about this scene. So the one is the one you just brought, which is where Carol and Therese come back at the end, um... It's the same thing that the movie starts with, where they're interrupted and then they come back. And sort of like I was thinking of when when the movie, we've seen the whole story and we come back to that scene in the hotel and she is telling Therese that she loves her. But before all of that, it's exactly what you were talking about. 
she has a new life. She has decided um, to leave Rindy behind, and now she's trying to get Therese back. And she's really laying it on thick. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but also, I think she's being very, like, there is, like, Kate is somebody who does such amazing work with her voice. Like, yes. she's one of the best voice actors. And I think that whole conversation, the way she says, I think the line that really gets me is when she says, I was hoping you might want to come live with me. And then she pauses and says, would you? Oh, no. She says, I thought you might want to come live with me, but I'm sure you won't. And she does that in the letter, um, in the letter that she writes to Therese, too. It's almost like she's talking Therese out of it as she's asking it because mm-hmm. she's, she's tra- protecting herself so dearly. Um, in the letter, she says, can you meet me at six? I understand if you can't. Like, yeah. um, and that's interesting to me because her confidence is really shot there. Yeah. She, she doesn't, she's not sure this is going to work. But she push, she pushes through. Yes, um, exactly. And what I love in that sentence is like sort of like the stop. And then when she drops her voice down, when she says, would you? And you can see in the way that the voice drops and the way her face sort of says it all. I mean, this is right before, you know, a second later or whatever, she will actually say that I love you. Yes. Right before they're interrupted. But to me, it's that would you, where you can see it in the voice. You can see it in her face that she has come to this is what she wants. She gave up her daughter and now this is what she wants. Right. The apartment's a nice big one. Big enough for two. I was hoping you might like to come live with me, but I guess you won't. Would you? Is this all going to be worth it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or also, maybe I should have handled this side of it before I handled that side. Who knows? (laughs) So Maggie, that is one of my top Kate Blanchett moments in the movie. I think as of this watching, it's my top moment. Mm-hmm. Um, why don't you tell me one of your top moments? Um, so I wrote them down in order as they appear. Um, so the first one is, I like the hat. I like the hat. Um, partially because that's the moment in the trailer, when I saw the trailer for the movie, that I thought, my life is over. This movie <laughs> is going to wreck me forever. Um And also, it is really bold, and she does this thing, she does it two or three times in the movie, right before she makes a hard move, her eyes get really big and wide, and it's, I mean, it's fear, probably, of like, okay, I'm doing this, and she also does it in the end, right before she, um, she says, Harge and I sold the house, Mm -hmm. where she's saying, oh, I'm doing it, here we go. Yeah. (laughs) She's starting. Yeah, the I like the hat is iconic. Oh, yeah. Because it's just like she's already told, basically told Therese that she kind of likes her and they've been flirting up the storm, but unable to say anything. She stares at her for how many? I think yeah. it's like 80 frames or something. Somebody counted once. Yeah. Yeah. And the I like the hat, she's sealing the deal. Yes. And making it very clear what she's doing. Yeah. In a way that you had to. Yes. Um, yeah, I love I like the hat. But oh, and sorry, one more thing. Um, <laughs> she says, I like the hat, but then looking down and looking up again, mm-hmm. um, that hits for me, especially because that is how my mom taught me to flirt when I was younger. She's like, this is how you do it. This is sexy eyes. You like look down and then look up at them. And so when she did it, it's like the, like the gif of Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the screen. Like, <laughs> that's it. She's flirting. I love that your mom thought you had to flirt. Oh, God. Neither of my parents taught me oh, anything about flirting. I was hoping I would get a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work. Um, so we're just going back. You have your five in order, but I'm just going back and forth. So my second, it's just that final frame in the movie. The smile, not smile. Like yes, she, the smiles. Yeah, the smiles, exactly. Like, it's half a smile. It's maybe, it's like so perfectly calibrated and it's perfectly calibrated from K, but also just perfectly calibrated as a movie ending because there is that note of hope, but also we don't know what's going to happen. We have no idea. And they don't know, neither Carol nor Therese know. Right. So it's just perfection of a final frame of this movie before the fade out. Yes. And I love it. 
And yeah. I think we're all thinking, I hope this works. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and it, it also kind of reminds me of the last shot of The Graduate, where they she's run off of her wedding, they're in a bus together, and they look at each other like, what are we doing now? Like, what is this? Okay, I guess we're doing this kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, it's it's this it's just the perfect. It's one of the best movie endings of all time. I am a little biased, but when I think of movie endings, um, and there are you know amazing movie endings. Like I, I think of um, Before Sunset, where you know she says, uh, "Baby, you're gonna miss that plane." That's such a perfect right. ending, one yeah. of the best endings. But this is kind of like that, yeah, because it's the same thing of like, oh, we just decided we we're gonna. Give this a shot, but right. we don't know what's going to happen. It's the end of the movie, but not necessarily the end of their story. Exactly. And that, especially from movies, we kind of crave that because we don't get it very often. Yeah. So it's only one of your moments. Um, so her next bold move that I like is invite me around. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just love how clearly she does all of these like bold moves. Um, and... So partially. set that up for us. What, what's oh, yes. about me around? So that's the first time um, Therese goes to Carol's house uh, after they've met at Frankenberg's and have lunch. And um, Therese is playing the piano for some reason. And um, and Carol, uh, they get to talking about art and their philosophies of art. And um, Therese mentions that she has some of her photographs at home. And I don't think Therese realized what she was doing in that moment, but Carol jumped on it. And said, oh, what a great <laughs> excuse for you to invite me over. Yes. Um, yeah. It's such a, um, and I'm thinking of another moment that's kind of the same like this. Um, that scene where she visits Therese and yes. brings the gift. Yes, and the, the way she kicks the, yes, the, the suitcase box. in, that's brilliant. Instead of handing it to her, it's... Yeah, and yes. this is like, this is Carol sealing the deal. Yes. And this is Kate playing Carol with the utmost confidence. She's just push, kicking it with her foot. And, you know, this is kind of a scene where she's like, she has so much confidence that Therese loves her at that moment. Yes. And it is just amazing to see. Yes, and it's like... She gives her this camera, which um, was an expensive camera. Mm -hmm. It would be the equivalent of someone handing you like a Nikon or something now, like a a DSLR camera. She spent some money on Therese, and the way she kicks it is like this old thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, (laughs) this is so cool. It's confident, but it's also sort of like she is. she is telling Therese that she's the top. Yes. This is where she's like, right. I'm the dominant one in this relationship. I'm giving you this big expensive <laughs> gift. And I'm just going to slide it in with my foot into your apartment. Real sugar mama moment. Um, <laughs> Therese is every inch of mommy's baby. <laughs> just yeah. to take it back to Frankenberg's. Um, I, that is one of my favorite shots in the movie. The sign of mommy's baby. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, we talked about that in, in one of my previous yes. episodes with, uh, with Shayna. Uh, yeah, Mommy's Baby is amazing. Oh, it's but classic. It's classic. But I love this moment because I think it is, it's sort of like, because the movie has so many sort of bigger, flashier moments that people might not notice this. But to me, this is always like, oh, she's asserting her dominance. Yes. I love it. Let's do it. Um, and I love that the movie and neither the, you know, n- none of the film is not Todd Haynes, not Phyllis Nodge, not Kate have sort of shied away from, like, showing on this, showing us this moment um, of, like, Carol is the top. And I love yeah. that it's visualized this way. Yes, and it's held back from us, that shot coming from her um, bedroom, I believe. Mm-hmm. And there's, like, the corner of the hallway kind of interrupting us. And I like how he gives, a, gives them that moment, gives them the privacy, and we just are kind of peering in on it. Because it is a, a really intimate moment between them yeah i love it it's so great this movie just rewards you when you watch it um every single time all right what's one of your moments um uh when abby says tell me you know what you're doing and carol says i don't i never did and that's another example of her voice work the way she goes really internally and 
she has a quieter voice and softer and it's a really vulnerable moment, but also confirmation that she didn't have a lot of this planned. Um, she doesn't really have that much game. She's just trying everything. <laughs> um, and that's what I like about her confidence because it is confident, but it's also, I hope to God this works. Mm -hmm. Let's see if it does. Um, kind of that boldness with blind boldness, I guess. <laughs> yes. I mean, only somebody in sort of Carol's stature um, and also Kate's just mastery as an actor would be able to sort of drop that line like that and yes. tell us so much. Um, yes, I could see how it could be overacted by someone else, but she let that one kind of sink away. And mm -hmm. I really... I appreciate that. Yeah. And it's so... I love that you brought this up because this was one of the first moments when I was watching, I think, the film for the first time was one of the moments that completely resonated with you, that completely resonated with me. <laughs> it did with me, too. You can speak for me. One <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, other moment I think that a lot of people love is the phone call after... Carol is very mean to Therese after Hart interrupts them and basically shoves her out of the house and yes. all of that. But then she calls her and and they have this wonderfully sad, melancholy conversation about basically, because in that moment they're thinking of all the roadblocks in front of them, that they can't be together, why they can't be together. That was just, they had this one nice evening, but it was interrupted by Hart. And that's, I think, is a sort of, they see it as this is probably what our relationship is going to be. What our oh, life is going to be like, yeah, yes. Always interrupted like mm -hmm. that and never being able to be with each other. But then suddenly there's a little bit note of hope because they talk about, you know, what they want to talk about with each other. And she says right. to her, ask me, ask me things. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ask me things, please. Yes. Um, and that is something I also noticed last night that I don't feel like I've noticed before is how often Carol asks in one way or another to be seen mm -hmm. um and to be seen beyond the the veneer beyond the glamour on the outside um, yeah and oh. at that point she's basically begging therese to, to be like let me tell you who i am <laughs> draw it out of me basically yeah and it's also just such a romantic moment because oh, it's yes. also you know people at the beginning of a relationship they don't know each other um and ask me things, it's just that. It's yes. like, let's talk about, let's get to know each other in told in the simplest of terms. Yes, it's a, it's the modern day equivalent of, um, what's your love language? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's really stupid. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Is that what people say? Oh, yes. Days? So like love language is like, um, I'm, I'm best giving verbally telling you I love you. Some people are more physically um, affectionate. Some people are like gift givers or spend oh, time with you. Okay. It's about how you um, express and receive love and which of those options works best for you. Mm. Yes. I think I've heard about this, but you know, I've been married for a long time. <laughs> so You don't have to worry about <laughs> things, silly things like communication. <laughs> yes, by... by <laughs> By this time, we know each other pretty well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Maggie, what is one other Kate as Carol moment that um, you love? So, the last one was actually Kate improvising. We love it. Yes. Um, and it's to President McKinley um, in, the, in the hotel. Because you, you see them playful and, mm -hmm. you know, they're, it's like they're being teenagers at a slumber party. Um, but then it's also kind of sexy. <laughs> and um, and it's also um, Carol's way of covering up, like, oh, I almost leaned in for a kiss, but it, we're not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's a joke <laughs> to defuse the situation. And this is before the sex. Before the sex, yes. Yeah. This is in when they're in Ohio, mm -hmm. and, which is the birthplace of McKinley. That's yes. why they're in the presidential suite. <laughs> The rate's attractive. Uh, yes, the rate's attractive. <laughs> the rate's not the only thing that's attractive. Yeah. Um, 
That is sort of like, you know, Carol is not a comedy, but that's one of the comedic moments. Oh, I mean, I consider Carol a comedy if you have the right audience. And the first time I saw it was at um, Angelica, and I think it was the first screening of the day it was released. And the theater was full of lesbians. Of course. And it was so fun. We really fed off the energy, and it it was a laugh riot. Yeah. Um, So I have one last moment, and this is sort of like, I have never thought of this scene or remembered it. Um, But last night when I was watching this to talk to you, I was like, this is a great scene. So this is the scene. It's the dinner with her in-laws where she is there waiting for Rindy, who is with some other relative. And her mother-in-law and her father-in-law are needling her about seeing the psychoanalyst. And she's basically, she's given up. Right? right, like she's at her most defeated. Carol is at her most defeated, um, and but then suddenly, you that confidence, that resolve comes back up when her father-in-law or ex-father-in-law, whatever he he is, um, sort of t- t- says something about the psychoanalyst being a doctor and being a Yale man, and, and then right. she drops her voice and she just like snaps at him. But that doesn't yes. make him a doctor. With the sarcasm that you don't really get from her before. She's mm-hmm. she's not that way until that moment. And you can tell she's on her last nerve. Yeah. And sort of like, I was just struck by how this is Carol at her lowest. At, this is Carol at her lowest, at her most defeated. But that confidence, that resolve comes back in that snap. And again, it's sort of like a voice work because everything else that she says in that scene is on a completely different register, this polite register but suddenly you hear the strain in her voice but you also hear the confidence and resolve back and I think that that maybe is the moment that Carol decides you know what I'm this is not what I want my life to be surrounded by these people waiting for my daughter trying to steal just a few moments with her while I'm unhappy yes this is not worth fixing yeah yes and so and it leads to the next scene which is the we're not ugly people hard and that has always been such a highlight of the movie. Yes. But basically, it's the clip. If there was an Oscar clip, that's the clip. Oh, absolutely. Um, but this scene right before it, I was just, I never thought of it as this amazing moment in Kate's performance until this watch. Right. And it, we kind of can take it back to the line um, when Harge drops her off after the Christmas party and she says, then what? It's over? Like, she's she's given up on this. She's She knows this is over. And at that point, she really has nothing left to lose. Um, oh, what if what if I make his parents mad? What is he going to do? Divorce me? <laughs> you yeah. Know? Um, where she's just the Burning Bridges tour. <laughs> That's what she's taking. <laughs> yes. Um, so listeners, Maggie and I have given you, I think, between us 10 <laughs> Top Kate Blanchett moments, including the moment she announces she's the top. So tell yes. us, <laughs> what are your top moments for Kate Blanchett in Carol? Wait, my top moments or my top moments? <laughs> either. It's like either. that interview where she says the gays or the gays. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think uh, another favorite moment of mine and absolute top energy is when she's in the shower and she very clearly forgot that sweater on purpose. Mm. And it's almost like the early part of the film are like several booby traps that she sets to try to make this work. And there, there has been debate among me and my friends of whether or not she left the gloves on purpose. Mm. Um, in my mind, there are gloves all over town and she's left them everywhere. <laughs> and this is the one that worked. But who knows? Um, it could have genuinely been an accident. Um, but yeah, that moment where she purposefully leaves that sweater so that Therese will see her in a row mm-hmm. and see her with her hair wet and see her at uh, stripped of all of that glamour. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. Yeah, it's, um, it's another great moment. So yes. many great moments in Carol. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why we go back to watch it. And the moment when she... Decide she's going to murder somebody. Like, she was ready gun. to kill. Yes. Wow. Um, I have to say the gun not going off is, um, it's great for that story, but I've been waiting for a gun to go off. And she finally gave us a gun going off this year in Nightmare Alley. Where Which her, I haven't seen yet. Uh, I'm so well, sad. Well, one thing, spoiler, 
her gun actually goes off this time. Finally. It, it fi <laughs> it's finally released. <laughs> So Carol, like all love stories, sort of lives or dies by the chemistry between the two leads. And this is some scorching chemistry between Ooh. Kate and Rooney. <laughs> um, and Kate always, one of the other themes of this podcast, is she's always better with women. Like, absolutely. Like, whether she's Aren't falling... we all? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, whether she's falling in love, like, in Carol, or their antagonists, like in Notes of a Scandal, or... Or Hannah. Or Hannah, yeah. or even something like Ocean's 8, where, you know, she, oh, the friendship Lord. between her and Sandra Bullock. Friendship. Yes. <laughs> they are exactly. in love. In quotation. <laughs> big quotation. Um, so tell me, Maggie, about why do you think the, the chemistry here works so well between Kate and Rooney? So the thing that makes their chemistry work so well, um, I think comes out of Rooney being a Kate fangirl, um, even if she isn't a Kate fangirl anymore, but being one as a teenager, um, because that is palpable and was before they even started making the movie when um, that moment when like Rooney presented her with an award or something and you could even see that chemistry there. Uh, they were very excited to be together. Right before she won the Oscar for Blue Jazz. Yes. Like some Santa Barbara film festival right, or yes. something. One of yeah, those yeah, yeah. lifetime achievement things. Yes. Um, and that kind of carries over. It reminds me of this moment in All About Eve when Eve, or when Margot catches Eve like bowing, holding the dress up to herself and bowing on stage and that knowing look of being there herself mm -hmm. and seeing herself, her younger self in Eve. In the way that I think Kate sees her younger self in Rooney and Carol sees her younger self in Therese. And being excited to um, guide someone through that. <laughs> like, I've been, I've, I've beat this level of, of the video game of life and mm -hmm. now I'm going to take you through it. Um, and there's kind of a, a beautiful, like, passing of the torch happening there. Yeah, and it, so it mirrors their, like, the relationship in the movie mirrors sort of like their relationship as two actors working, you know, one looking up to the other. Yes. Um, and, and it's also just like, I think the film itself sort of charts that in, in a way that Therese at the beginning is sort of like a little not sure. She's not even sure what to order for lunch. And by right. the end, she's got a little bit of Carol's confidence. Right. She kind of has a makeover. She's, uh, she's buying into to femininity and to society mm -hmm. a little more. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And even her saying no that she wouldn't move in with her, that's that took a lot of courage, I'm sure, for Therese to choose herself before choosing Carol. Um because you can tell that that's out of character for her. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's um it's it's always like when I think of like the great love story pairings, um like in movies, who are some of the people that I really love watching? Um, and, you know, Rudy and Kate are always at the top. But I think what's, what's even a little bit more um, is this extra layer that you were talking about that they bring um, to the performance, but also it's in the story of like, they're not equals at the beginning. Like there is a sort of power dynamic going on. We've already talked about the top moment. But I think there is just... Um, there that it's an extra layer of like one is so has so much more power at the beginning, right? And um, some of that is by way of Therese essentially working for her, being customer service, and she's a customer. Yes, and there is that class divide too. Yeah, and there is an age divide. Yes. There's an experience. Mm -hmm. um, there is like Therese doesn't even have the words. She doesn't know whether she's queer. She probably doesn't know what that is. She's oh, she's yes, discovering absolutely. that. Um, while well, Carol already has that. And I think it plays so beautifully in that by the end, you know, when we talked a little bit about that scene where, where Carol tells her that she loves her, like the 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 power ch dynamic changes. Completely. By the end, Therese has more power. Yes, absolutely. And it's, and it's Carol basically begging um, mm -hmm. yeah. for it to work out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's something to behold. Like oh, it's so absolutely. crazy. Like, um, 
And I, I don't, in, in love stories on screen, like, you know, you don't see that sort of power imbalance as a text in the love story, so visibly as the text of that love story in a lot of movies as you see it in Carol. Right, so often it's about um, someone, one person pursuing and then finally conquering the, the relationship, and this is such a partnership. In the same way that I think queer relationships are very different from straight relationships. Yes. <laughs> um, that we communicate so much better from the beginning. <laughs> yes. And it's, it feels a little more equal. Oh, um, yeah. So many things about Carol. <laughs> um, so, so many. So many things to discover. So, Maggie, we talked a little bit earlier about the confidence that Kate brings to her performance as Carol. And I think that is one of the things why I keep going back to this performance as maybe the pinnacle of Kate on screen. Yes. It's that confidence that we've seen in so many of her parts. You know, maybe not Blue Jasmine, but there's right. always <laughs> confidence in who she plays. And that that's what I love about it, about this performance. Yes, and I see an element of work and growth, even though the movie doesn't show Carol growing maybe in that way. You see that backstory. So I've been thinking a lot about my childhood and stuff and um, that people made me feel like I was choosing to be weird and choosing to be different. And now looking back, I just was different. Um, And I wasn't trying to be different. I just was. And my willingness to live authentically made other people feel threatened because they were choosing not to live authentically. Um, And that's definitely happening between Carol and the society, the Ridgewood, New Jersey society of uh-huh. Harge and, and being the perfect housewife and dressing in a formal gown to go to this Christmas party. Um, and also she makes it pretty obvious when she lies or makes an innuendo. It's so obvious that she's, again, begging to be seen and begging to be called out. Um, and, and finally, when Therese does see her, whether it's through a camera or saying something like, I want to see you mm-hmm. when they finally yeah. at Waterloo. Um, that's, that's finally coming true for Carol. And it's kind of, is that moment of her looking back and saying, no, I just am weird. This is just me. <laughs> yeah. And finally someone else is saying that. Yeah. Oh, this movie and this performance, <laughs> so many things. Um, I wanted to ask you a th- couple of fun questions about Kate. Yeah. So you mm-hmm. mentioned that moment where Kate and Rooney, um, or Rooney presents Kate with that award at Santa Barbara or whatever, but they had so many moments. And as people who love this movie and saw all their press tour <laughs> stuff, um, what are what is something else that you really like about that Carol press tour? I mean, anytime they queer baited us, it was so fun. Um <laughs> All of the lesbians on Twitter just had a field day, but especially uh, when they were at Cannes and uh, and Todd had to sit between them. In yes, that, that video, yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, there was, was there something about chest hair or something? Yes, that? there yes. was. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Where you can tell between them being tired and having a lot of fun there um, that they are just riffing and that that kind of is their connection outside of their characters, that they can just go at it like that all day. (laughs) Yeah, and and Rooney Mara is not somebody who's very demonstrative in in, in press tours, but she was. It really brought it out of her, and that just shows that they have natural chemistry. Yeah, and Kate is somebody like, you know, in interviews, it's so funny when you watch her interviews, she's she's cagey. He's, yes. She's very cagey. Like, I noticed in her interviews, like, she only says what she wants to say. Like, somebody would ask her a question, and she's, a lot of times, she disregards the question and just would say what she wants to say. But also, like, she relaxed Rooney, but I think Rooney made her a little bit more fun, more open than she usually is. I've noticed you can kind of tell, like, with the Cinderella press tour, she's she's, um, appropriate and she's well-behaved until maybe the end and when she's done and that's like that moment with that one guy who asked about the cat and she said that's your fucking question yeah um like we we love it when uh when she gets a little fed up and yeah. with reporters questions 
Yes. So I fell in love with Kate, as listeners of this podcast know, and I saw Elizabeth a long time mm-hmm. ago. Um, what was your first time watching Kate? I believe it was Elizabeth. Um, it also could have been uh, Talented Mr. Ripley. Mm. Um and the first time that I really remember seeing her and um, being taken aback by her as a person was Benjamin Button. Mm. Um, because she's I, so gorgeous. I saw, in that film. Oh, she's gorgeous. Oh, God. I think that's one of her most beautiful films, uh, uh, her at her peak beauty. Yeah, <laughs> she is amazing. Yes. And besides Carol, what's your favorite Kate Blanchett performance? Who? So I think my other favorite Kate performances would be Mrs. America, as weird as it is to choose that. I know. Um, I do not align with Phil Schlafly at all, but I think that's part of why she is so good in that role. And I have always loved watching my favorite actresses play terrible people because you have to suspend disbelief and, um, and as an actor, you have to believe what that character is saying, even if it is so horribly wrong. And so she really commits to it. And speaking of commitment... Maggie, manif- this is the first time somebody on this show ever mentioned This is America as <laughs> okay. their favorite Kate Blanchett To be fair, part of it is when she, like, uh, when she pushes Sarah into the bed. <laughs> like, that moment, I wasn't sure if it was a dream or not. I, oh. I was really happy. Uh, that's so funny. <laughs> but uh also speaking of commitment to character or characters uh manifesto mm. um i just love that she did something really out of the ordinary and how she committed to all of those roles um especially the newscaster which yes. obviously informed a lot of don't look up yeah um and that, was, just, that one was so funny, yeah. It's so brilliant and tongue-in-cheek, and she's so on board. I love it when an actor truly commits, and, you know, it's going to be great, or it's going to be strong and wrong, mm-hmm. as we say in theater. Yeah. But just do it, and we'll see if it hits or not. Did you see the exhibition when it came to the armory? I did. Oh. It did, was wonderful. You see that moment. Um, for those of you who've seen the Manifesto exhibition, there is a moment where there are 13 Kate Blanchett. Yes. And you're going My through dream. the ex- <laughs> You're going <laughs> through the exhibition. And then there is a moment where all 13 come together. Yes, and they're to, singing together. They yeah. say the same things. And where, when, wherever you are in the exhibition, the, all the screens will show the same things. And it's... it's it's as if they were coming at you. Yes. And what more do you want? 13 Kate Blanchett's coming at you. That I mean, is I think the, the only thing I would want more is 14. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, and that was interesting um, from a musical standpoint, too, because she sings different pitches on mm-hmm. all of them um, and the way it comes together. But also when she plays the mom and the, the country mom and names all of the kinds of arts that she's thankful for, like cat poop art and stuff like chocolate cake or whatever it's uh it's hilarious yeah oh it's... i, I want to see her be funny more yes. this is this is what i want in the future give us oceans nine like ev- let's do oceans... oceans nine debbie and lou's wedding yes so <laughs> if everyone else conspires to steal something from their wedding that's i just gave you a movie yeah totally um, run with it yeah do that um so Kate might get nominated for an Oscar. I was just talking to you about this. And yes. I, I'm kind of scared a little bit. Um, I love Nightmare Alley. Mm-hmm. I, I think critics and audiences haven't given this movie the accolades it deserves. It's really well done. Yes. Coming it. out the week that Omicron hit yeah. certainly didn't help. Yeah. And Guillermo del Toro is a, uh, Guillermo del Toro is a genius, yes. and I think Kate, we just talked about Benjamin Button, how amazing she looks. She looks so amazing in Nightmare Alley, and it's one of, it's the best she's ever looked, but also it's a great performance. And she got the SAG nomination, which was sort of a surprise. Right. But now I'm kind of scared, because <laughs> I never thought that I would want Kate not to get an Oscar nomination. <laughs> right. But if she gets in at the expense of my beloved friend, favorite performance of this year, which is Ruth Nega in passing, I'm going to yes. lose it. And I feel the same way with my one of my very close friends, Ariana DeBose, of actual friends, um, that it could get in the way of her first Oscar nomination and hopefully win. Um, but yeah, I I don't think 
I think I Ariana think DeBose is pretty everyone. safe. I think she's a lock, but I yeah. don't want to be too confident about it. Um, but Roos is not, I think, because just yeah. her film is not as beloved as some of the other films. Right. Um, like, the other films in the category, they all have Best Picture, like The Power of the Dog and Belfast and whatever. Um, and so I am... I feel a little afraid for Ruth Nega. <laughs> so, Kate, if you're listening, <laughs> turn it down if Ruth doesn't get it. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're recording this um, on the day that the Oscar voting closes, and I think um, by the time you listen to this, you might know who right. is nominated. It's like the 12th, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's next week. So, yes. um, did Kate get nominated? Tell us from the future. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening. Um, <laughs> She did, but Ruth and Ari also got them. All right, that's that's, that's perfect. Thanks, everyone, for sending that to me. <laughs> Maggie, this was such a wonderful conversation, but I think you have one more surprise for our listeners, so tell me. I do. Um, so I am not just a fan of Carol. I am a crazy fan of Carol, and somehow I found an online auction for some of the screen-used items in Carol, and I purchased a large poster, really a board, um, that uh, was a part of the Frankenberg set. I don't think it ever made it to the screen. Um, I, I keep looking, <laughs> hoping I'll find it. But it's called Baby Bella. There is, which, or Bella Baby, which uh-huh. you also see on a sign. So oh. there was a Bella Baby. Um, and there is a baby doll attached to it and it's pretty creepy and it says make her cry make her sob make her coo which i think is pretty um telling (laughs) that basically describes the plot of carol yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i love all of the innuendo in the set design of frankenbergs um so it's it's wonderful to own a piece of carol yeah oh wow I just owned a DVD. That's all I have. (laughs) You're still with us. You're still a fan. Yes. Maggie, this has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for coming on Sunday's Escape to talk with me about Carol. I had such a good time. Um, Yeah, me too. I love it. Um, And our Carol friendship will continue. Um, And listeners, um, we have one more episode that we're going to talk about Carol in this episode. last season of the podcast and we're going to talk about a couple of more movies charlotte gray babel so that's what's coming up in the next few weeks of the podcast um but for now before we go maggie tell our listeners where they can find you online um i'm on twitter at official maggie l keep the official in there just in case i (laughs) need it Um, (laughs) and yeah, that's that's where you can find me talking at length about a, a bevy of stupid topics. Give Maggie a follow. She's a great follow. And you can find me on Twitter at M-E underscore says and follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Sundays with Kate. And until next time, thank you for listening.